Welcome everyone who's here. It's, it's delightful to see so many people. We've got um, coming up for 300 attendees now, which is fantastic. Um, this event, as you can see from our lovely backdrops, is being brought to you by the European Illustrators Forum. And I've put a, a link to that into the chat so you can check out um, more about what we do, more details there. Um, I'm Derek Brazel. I'm um, EIF co-president and um, publications and membership uh, manager at the UK's Association of Illustrators, and I'm very pleased to welcome you all. So the European Illustrators Forum has been in existence for, well, since 2003, I've realised, which actually is our 20th anniversary. Um, we're a network of 17 national associations of, of illustrators in European countries, representing thousands of illustrators, providing a platform for contact and meetings between the associations. Um, and you can find a list of the associations here. I'm just about to stick that into chat. So that's part of our website, but that details um, all the various associations who are part of uh, the EIF. So we hold regular meetings of the group online and where possible in person um, at events such as the Bologna Children's Book Fair and the Frankfurt Book Fair. This gives us a really useful perspective on the issues facing um, illustrators in Europe, and each organisation is able to feed into their, exper their experiences back into the group. Um, if you're watching today and if you're aware of an association in your country who is not a member of the EIF, um, please ask them to get in touch with us. We always welcome more members and we haven't got representation from every single country, so please let us know if you've got uh, anyone, any organisations in your country. So our focus at EIF is on protecting the rights of illustrators in Europe, um, improving contract standards and pricing within the industry. And this has resulted in campaigns such as Price It Right, mm -hmm. which was a campaign aimed at supporting illustrators and commissioners in confident pricing and negotiation, um, and events at the book fairs on such subjects as contracts, publishing contracts, licensing artwork, self-promotion for your work and more. And we've recently undertaken a diversity survey of illustrators across Europe, and we'll be publishing the results of that in the near future. So please keep an eye on the EIF website um, for our announcements um, on the analyzed results, which should be coming fairly soon. As um, individual illustrators, you will recognize that uh, we are all stronger together, and we encourage you to join the organization in your country uh, to receive support from them but also to support their existence as they're all working towards improving conditions for illustrators. And as we are aware, there are lots of challenges. Generative artificial intelligence is one of the biggest things to hit world headlines um, in a long time. It is more accurately defined as machine learning um, as there is no actual intelligence being used in the generation of images, texts, music, audio, code, and more by artificial intelligence. It's captured people's attention because we hadn't fully realized that AI could make inroads into the creative arena. And this of course is one of the aspects that alarms us all as illustrators. You know, what are people's reactions? How will AI change the illustration marketplace? Um, is generative AI going to be used extensively by illustration commissioners to form their own images? And so remove potential commissions from us as illustrators? Generative platforms train their AI on vast numbers of images that have been scraped from the internet by data mining. Can we get compensation for this use of our work? What are the legal issues? Is the use of our images without permission a copyright infringement? What is current EU legislation saying? We'll discuss these aspects today alongside the other important side of AI, which is how illustrators can use it as a tool. Um, maybe we are the best people, best people, best place to do that. Um, and illustrator and motion director Tobias Wustenfeld will be giving us a short introduction on how mm -hmm. generative AI works, which would be really useful um, to give those of us a sense of how these things can be used um, in a positive way. After Tobias, we have uh, four speakers discussing ongoing developments in generative artificial intelligence and its impact on the illustration industry. So I'd like to welcome our panel, who you can see above me. Um, first off, illustrator, artist, and academic, Paolo Rui, who has been involved with the European Illustrators Forum 
and the Italian organization for illustrators and comic artists, Associazioni Autori di Immagini, uh, Immagini I'm going to get this wrong, um, for many years. Uh, Nergul uh, Chenefe, who is president of the Illustrators Platform and founding president of the Children's Book Writers and Illustrators Society in Turkey. Um, she's also a writer, translator, and editor. Author and illustrator Anna Karina Birkenstock, who is on the board of the German Illustratoren Organization and sits on panels for the Deutsche Design Tag and the Deutsche Kulturat. And finally, uh, Italian illustrator, comic book artist, and art director Francesco Archidiacono, who is a founding member of the European Guild for AI Regulation. Our speakers will have around 20 minutes uh, each on their various subjects. Um, we'll have time for questions and answers towards the end. Please type your questions into the chat section or the, the question box. Um, and if it is not a general question, please indicate which speaker you are aiming your question at so we know who to pose that question to. Um, I think we've enabled closed captions. Um, might need to check that. If we haven't, we'd like to get closed captions um, working. Um, let me see. I can't see them down there, but hopefully they are. Um, so if you'd like to read what we're saying, click the CC button at the bottom. To let you know the session is being recorded and we will make this available at a point in the future from the EIF website. We can't give you an exact date yet, but we will aim to do this as, you know, as soon as we can. We ask that you please remain on, on mute with your microphones to manage any background noise. Um, and obviously you don't need your camera on if you prefer not to, that's completely fine. So many thanks to everybody. And what we'll start off with now is a um, presentation from, from Tobias. who will start us off with insights into how artists can use AI. So over to you. Yeah, hello everybody. I just uh, start to uh, share my green screen right away. Um, I hope you can see this. So yeah, I'm, I'm Tobias Wüstefeld. I'm from Hamburg, Germany, and I'm an illustrator. And uh, I don't know, um, <clears throat> my, my, my view on AI pretty much changed over the time. So uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, um, talk a little bit of, of the usage in the past. So this was 2015, where I first uh, came in contact with AI, which was basically, the, which was Deep Dream, uh, a system which could see dogs everywhere, and you could put in your image and uh, get it uh, some sort of dog over there. Um, then three years ago, I think, yeah, uh, no, end of 2019, I, I got into the um, um, uh, project where uh, we use GPT-2 and uh, train um, uh, train some sort of Sigmund Freud uh, double so that uh, the audience of an Austrian uh, art festival could uh, talk to him. Um, yeah, and for that we use GPT-2, which is uh, the predecessor of uh, ChatGPT. So um, I trained my own AIs a few years ago for, for that, uh, as, as, as it's broadly discussed, uh, you need a lot of data. And <clears throat> for me, it was back then uh, crucial to have most of the data from my side. So I spent a few weeks like creating uh, these uh, 3D characters here. Um, um, but then I also must admit, I scraped some data from the internet and I, um, had uh, um, some data that I scraped where I exchanged eyes or uh, did some uh, some changes. If you know, it's uh, pretty uh, straightforward. You just put the images into a folder and uh, then usually it starts by noise. Um, this time not because it was already trained, but then uh, from the data, uh, it it gets more and more towards the data. And here I didn't like uh, the eyes, as I told. And so I got back and exchanged the eyes on a few thousand uh, um, characters. And so it learned a different kind of eyes. So it will always uh, only learn what's inside the data set. Here you can see the training over time um, on, on a more broader uh, view. Um, then if you have this this network, uh, you can do fine tuning. That's something that's also often used nowadays with stable diffusion and so on for that. I created like 100 to 200 uh, clay figures and uh, photographed them from different directions and so on. And then the fine tuning process is actually much faster than the overall training. I think the overall training 
uh, took the computer something like two months and the fine tuning is only something like which it takes one or two days because the AI already knows concepts like uh, uh, eyes and uh, noses and so on. Um, yeah, and in the end, at this system, which is StyleGun2, you have uh, then have the possibility to to interpolate uh, between the different images or um, the systems are quite good at interpolating. That's where they are really strong at. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit how AI works, um, but I must admit I'm no programmer and I try to uh, keep it uh, uh, fairly simple to, to so that the basic concepts uh, can be understood hopefully. So first of all, you need to uh, turn the uh, the data you have into some sort of vector representation. Um, in uh, if you have an image, it's fairly straightforward. You have the pixels which have like the red, green, blue uh, value. So you have already have some sort of uh, three dimensional uh, vector which you can pretty. Uh, easy plug into a, a neural network. For text, it isn't that easy because uh, um, every letter doesn't make sense to put a number to it. So in 2017, they came up with a transformer network and this is a network which is most often used and it's like finding some abstract form or some data distribution for each word. For example, if you have the word dog, the data distribution might look something like this, or if you have the word chasing, it might look something like this. And if you put them both together on the same canvas, the, the word chasing will influence the word dog. So maybe um, um, if it's uh, um, it, it's less likely a lab dog, but it's more likely uh, some sort of hand, hunting dog. And also this other way around, the uh, the chasing will influence as uh, the, the dog will influence the word chasing. So this you can then plug on top of a neural network and uh, let the data some sort of flow th uh, through the layers, and um, out comes a new word. Maybe in this case it's cat, and uh, this you can put on top again, and it will form a new distribution, influence each other words. And so this is the way uh, ChatGPT or the text models work. Like you basically feed in the word again and again. During learning, you actually know what's the next word. And um, that's the whole process of if AI learns uh, the weight. So the middle part here is adjusted in such a way that it most likely predicts the outcome. And this wouldn't work without the data. So um, there are different kinds of models. For example, this uh, style gun model I used uh, will start with a, a single number, and then the network will get more complicated and uh, bigger over time. Um, but without any guidance, it will only produce noise, different noise patterns. So what uh, Ian Goodfellow came up with in 2014, I think, um, have it connected to a, a second AI, which is a telling, which only gets the forgery from the generator here on the left and uh, the image from the data set here. And so it can tell if it's uh, the, the purpose of the AI on the right side is uh, to only tell if it's uh, truth or false, and this will guide the generator on the left. And so they both over time get better and better at doing their jobs. Um, but uh, now, now a, a short journey <laughs> from what actually happens in this nowadays uh, the systems. How how is uh, the, what's happening with the data? Here is, for example, an illustration I did, uh, which is on the uh, website of Illustration X. And uh, what happens now is Lion. They are actually based here in Hamburg. Um, they they take the image and download it, and they, the first thing they do, uh, they pass it through the clip network. And the clip is um, is designed in such a way you have also two AIs in this case. One is for images and one is for descriptions. And they both uh, put out some data distribution down there. And what you do is you compare the data distributions to match it most closely. So in the end, you have a system which is... Uh, um, which lets you connect text and image. So Lion puts my image in there and gets uh, gets some embedding, and that's what they uh, um, um, not sell, but what they uh, um, 
uh, they, they provide the link together with the data distribution down there. And there is uh, something funny. If you look at this uh, uh, embedding, actually, um, that's what the, the clip AI saw in my image. Is he got something right. Like, for example, a group of horses and paper art is pretty right. But there are also um, it was addressed to some other artists, with, which aren't me. So um, the whole Greg Witkowski thing is probably also because uh, the, the clip network did some wrong attributions. And so Greg, every acrylic painting might be somehow be connected to Greg Witkowski as well. So yeah, um, so and there's another thing Lion does, they do some aesthetic predictions. So this is what the average data set should look like, but they do like aesthetic weights. And uh, this is how, uh, if you, only choose the high weights, you also get only the high quality uh, illustrations and photography. So they provide this, like the data set um, um, here, and often also a few images are uh, are doubled. I, I think I found more than 200 images for me in the data set. Um, after that, it's downloaded by companies like uh, Stable Diffusion or, or Stability AI or um, um, yeah, Midjourney and and all the others. <laughs> um, the the Midjourney thing is uh, um, relying on the same principle, like stable diffusion. So I explain the stable diffusion here a bit. Um, so what stable diffusion does, it takes in the image, and um, also puts it through a network which gets smaller, and out comes a very sparse representation of the image. So um, it's mainly only the concepts or something like this. And both of these uh, AIs are trained in such a way that first uh, the input sh should match the output. So in this case, they really have something like a compression algorithm on this level, but uh, they go further. They want to work down there on this level. This is only only something like the, the, um, the borders around the model. So. In this uh, lower dimensional space, uh, they um, do pretty much something like a new AI, which does the noise prediction. It, it's shown uh, image and noise, and it should predict what kind, uh, what is actually the noise. And this uh, removal of noise is again uh, guided by CLIP. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned it, but CLIP uh, was provided by OpenAI, and this is uh, for uh, for open source and this is what uh, uh, got this whole thing <laughs> started like a few years ago so and uh, they, they, so the model learns step by step to get better at uh, predicting more and more noise always guided by the text input by the clip model um so if i now generate something after the training is done um for example uh, uh, then then step by step from the noise, the clip will find a new image. In this case, I just put in the prompt that the clip predicted from my image back and uh, I get something like this. It's not exactly the same image, but maybe a little bit different. So yeah, this is pretty much how the process looks. It's, uh, somehow might switch to different concepts and find other stuff again there. Yeah. So yeah. I think nowadays everyone heard this thing, how this works. You type in a text and get all the image in the end. So um, what, what I want to point out again, it's really crucial to know there isn't, even if there isn't the exact image inside the network was in the middle, uh, the data is absolutely crucial to form uh, these connections here. These weights are based only on the data. Without data, the AI is nothing. And there is no programmer who sits there and says, like, if you want to do a paper horse, you should do something like this. Um, so without data, there is nothing. And the weights, actually, the thing in the middle, there, I heard different things, what they might be called. I also heard they might be called algorithms. And if you compare how many algorithms the programmers provide uh, to the AI and how many algorithms are provided by the data, then the, the amount of effort <laughs> put into these algorithms is uh, fairly small from the programmers, uh, pretty big from the side of the data providers. 
So uh, one more small thing I want to uh, uh, say is glaze. That's actually another AI which can alter your image and somehow protect it. Because if you have um, this sort of protection, uh, your images will look like this to the AI. So this is actually a way to uh, harm these AIs. If I looked at the embeddings of this image, for example, afterwards and here, so I already got it wrong, like people riding on the back of horses uh, and, and stuff like that. So uh, I, I really can recommend to use glaze to uh, protect your images. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I, I hope this yes, was a fast overview. Great. Thank you for that, Tobias. Really useful. It's fascinating stuff because it's um, uh, trying to understand what's actually happening um, in the depths with all that machine learning is is rather complicated, but it's use it's really useful to have a, a sense and understanding of how it actually um, gets put together. I put some links actually in the chat if people want to see Glaze, um, and also a link to the the Leon database, which um, you may be aware is is getting close. It took close to six million um, images from the internet, so it's got a lot of stuff to work with. About five billion, it's actually. Oh, sorry, billion, billion. Yes, not million. <laughs> yeah, it's even worse, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yes, six billion. So it's got a lot of stuff. Um, yeah. And you know, there's many issues around it all, especially with a sort of a Western bias and, well, many, many, many um, biases built into actually, it. Actually, so the image I showed from Illustration X, I wrote to them, they should get it out. And my agency also wrote, but they, uh, they don't care. <laughs> So it's no, there's, yeah, there's um, there's oh, I'll put the link in as well. There's a website called Have I Been Trained, which you you might be aware of, um, which you can drag your own images into, and it'll tell you whether your work is in the Leon database. I've I found my work in there as well. Yeah. Um, so it's uh, yeah, it's very concerning, very concerning stuff. Um, well, thank you very much for that, and <laughs> if we can if we can now spotlight um, Paolo. Um, Paolo's going to be discussing um, the state, current status quo versus how the illustration market kind of may change moving forward. So he'll be discussing that for a little while once he's on screen. Yep. Have you got a presentation, Paolo? Yes, I've got my presentation, but uh, okay, I should restart. Okay, or shall it, you, you first learn. remove the other one? I try. Okay. Yeah, here it is. I can still see yeah. Tobias's. <laughs> Life before AI. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, I'm Paolo Gui, and now I'm going to, to talk about issues which are related to our profession before the, the explosion that happened last year with a uh, when everybody became aware of uh, what AI can do in uh, in in, uh, in our job, okay. So let's start with the. Oh, where is it? Sorry. Okay. Okay. Never in history we have experienced the production and consumption of images as we are witnessing now. Although there are significant statistics specifically related to illustrations, even if this represents just a fraction of the 1.2 trillion uh, pictures taken in 2022, we realized that the numbers are quite astounding. And it's a trend which is in increasing year by year. Uh, the global democratization of image usage uh, skyrocketed during the digital era. And it's safe to say that the visual content produced in 2023 alone surpasses everything created in human history until the year 2000. So we are in a situation where um, there is a vast and growing market for illustrations with more illustrators graduating or teaching themselves commercial art than ever before. The demand for illustrations is rising and there is an abundance of professionals ready uh, to meet this demand. While this, while this may uh, seem like an ideal situation, it's not without its challenges because uh, I will show you from now on and explain in this presentation which are the issues that 
uh, can seriously affect our work um, now that AI is entering the mainstream. So we start with that. Um, before I start talking about those issues, um, I would like to um, give you a short note um, about all the fact that as in all areas of human activities, there is the good, the bad, and the ugly. And uh, therefore, not all clients are unfairly exploiting illustrators and authors. Uh, and it's quite to the contrary, actually. And uh, those who behave correctly, um, actually, they should deserve our praise because they are working in an environment of unfair competition with others. And so they spend more to obtain something like um, is the same project, product that they want to create. So um, we must praise them for the work they keep doing. So today we actually, we concentrate mostly on those who don't behave well. And we start from the market. Okay. Um, the market offers us quite a few challenges for us. Okay. The first challenges uh, are like this, the, the one, sorry, if I, I'm kind of embarrassed. I'm kind of emotional today. So many people today, so I'm not used to talking in front of so many people. Um, life for illustrators before AI, okay, challenges the market. Frequent distortion of market supply and demand rules. For instance, there are many illustrators available for this job. So if you don't like the, the our offer, we can find somebody else. Frequent abuse of dominant position. Do you want to work with, uh, with us? These are the rules, take it or leave it. Widespread lack of respect and understanding by commissioners for creators and the value of illustration. In the speed of a distant and offers shallow work relationship with uh, occasional clients, there's not much space for empathy and appreciation of an illustrator's creative effort. Illustration becomes a product and it's also just a cog in a machine. Widespread use of unbalanced contracts. Many such agreements request copyright assignments far beyond the initial scope of the first usage without any adjustment of the offered or agreed fee. Then we have widespread use of inappropriate forms of agreements such as uh, for work for hire contracts. This kind of agreements may deprive illustrators of their copyrights and treat them as plumbers, electricians or window cleaners rather than authors. And then we have widespread offering of low fees and more interest in shareholders' happiness than uh, uh, on authors' needs and rights. In a highly competitive market where positive balance sheets are the ultimate goals, the easier way to cut uh, costs is uh, on the variable and weak part of the production line, which is authors and illustrators. Then we have frequent copycat attitudes of new players who base the uh, business model on the above trends and habits. It happens that new agencies and publishers and clients improve their, uh, improvise their activity by downloaded contracts, models, or agreements from the internet that don't reflect the balanced character that a um, client illustrator business relationship should have. Lack of recognition for the value of research and development uh, carried out by illustrators within the industry. Innovation is necessary, but clients seldom give illustrators credit for such continuous effort, which is simply considered part of the job and not worth mentioning or gratifying any further. General devaluation of illustrator of illustration due to the ever expanding uh, of prepackaged images of, offered by image banks. The need to produce um, instant content for news outlets at light speed has contributed to the misunderstanding that illustration is a quick product that cannot cost much because in the ever expanding availability of ready to go illustrations. As an example now, I'm going to show you a series of uh, illustrations. Um, mostly of, all of them are digital actually. Some um, are photo illustrations, therefore they are based in part uh, completely on illustration and so they are basically some digital collage uh, on the same subject. In this case is the relationship between uh, the US and China. Some have some dignity, some less so, uh, but what they have all in common is the fact that some illustrators try to make a living 
working on series of very quick illustrations that they know some, someone somewhere one day might need. This mass production of images in the end becomes for some a way to barely make ends meet, but for many others means the loss of jobs and the lowering of fees. As individuals, we surely must think uh, for ourselves, but nevertheless, we have a responsibility towards others. Some illustrators sign their works with their own names, others prefer to use a pseudonym, likely to differentiate the very commercial illustrations from uh, those with a higher artistic value. So these, you see many samples from iStock and other famous um, image banks. For your information, the fees for illustrators and photographers are paid as royalties in percentages that are, as an average, are a few uh, euro cents per image per month. You do the calculations on uh, how many images you have to produce in one month in order to, to pay the rent. Yeah. And this is just a, a small window on uh, just on this tiny subject. If you go and look for them, you're going to find thousands. Some have been used also on the, on the web on the BBC website. So it's quite astonishing how many people are concentrated on the same on the same subject beforehand. Then we have the public. Um, the public, the, the further challenges come from the relationship that the public has with our work. Okay, number one is the underestimation of the cultural and social value of illustration. The sociological impact of illustration on everyday life can range from subtle to substantial, depending on where one lives. However, its pervasiveness in uh, developed economies makes it an integral part of the visual environment we are exposed to since birth. Illustrators add, uh, add, add colors to life, but its value often becomes apparent only when it's absent. Then we have a limited understanding of the meaning of copyright, both in moral and economic terms. Most of what surrounds us in our daily life is covered by one form or other of legal protection, including industrial and copyright. But if professionals themselves often lack a deep understanding of these issues, it's far more challenging for the general public to grasp their meaning. Quick image consumption and limited interest in these issues. In the rapid flow of crossfire or of image on social media, where the, um, dozens or, or, or hundreds of them are viewed in seconds, it's natural for people to overlook the uh, intrinsic value of individual pieces. Accustomed to enjoy free content. Once one gets accustomed to free content, something that should be exceptional becomes given for granted, thereby diminishing its perceived value. Then we have institutions. Institutions, um, of course, situations may vary according to the country you're living in, okay, all right? But uh, so these are just general issues that can affect, that might affect some of us in uh, some moments of our lives. So we have the impact of external factors such as COVID-19 on the income and livelihoods of freelance illustrators. Freelancers in various fields face similar challenges as the relative freedom they enjoy comes at the, uh, at the cost of uncertainty. When natural disasters or misfortunes strike, governments often struggle to address the needs of such diverse group. Widespread lack of attention and understanding of uh, issues related to the, to the illustration industry. Direct lobbying with uh, institutions is necessary, but it can be time consuming for organizations like the EIF and others. And on the, uh, by the time the new regulations are implemented, they may already be outdated or in need of, re of uh, reviewing. Limited interest in a marginal side of the economy like the illustration industry, and that's a problem. Then we have lack of control. Uh, there is no uh, regular or mandatory state oversight of contracts and agreements in this field, leaving illustrators uh, on their own when uh, navigating the complexities of legal terminology. Costly legal defense. Even when clients require the signing of legally incorrect agreements, it falls to the illustrator to go to court and defend his or her rights. However, this is often not worth pursuing due to the low fees and compensations and the high costs associated with legal defense. 
And then we have illustrators themselves. Uh, in the wider illustrator consider in the widest uh, term, the widest sense of the term. Widespread lack of awareness regarding their own rights. Basic knowledge of copyright should uh, ideally be taught in school, but until that becomes a reality, many illustrators remain unaware of copyright principles in their own country and know even less about foreign working environments. Widespread lack of understanding the value of their own work. Many illustrators, especially early in their careers, struggle to determine fair compensation for the time and the rights they assign with their work. Widespread lack of negotiating skills. Experience helps, but it's not always sufficient. Then we have widespread perception of unfair business practices and widespread perception of being exploited. These last two issues can be determined detrimental because one's mood can certainly affect work quality and uh, as a consequence, a less enjoyable professional life. Fortunately, many are aware of these problems and are willing to learn more to overcome them and lead a more fulfilling professional life. Besides, as we'll see shortly, there, there are ongoing actions such as today's conference. Illustrator's training. Uh, another serious challenge comes from the way professional art education is taught. There is a limited availability and stress on the importance of professional training. Most art schools and acad academies rightfully prioritize the development of their students' artistic expression over non-artistic business and professional skills. However, this can result in a challenge uh, when both illustrators and art directors, which come from the same schools, enter the job market with insufficient awareness and preparation regarding these issues. They, they, uh, then they might uh, adapt to a business model that is already chronically affected uh, by the above um, mentioned trends and habits. There are solutions, and the uh, EIF, European International Illustration Associations, are working in this direction. Talking about solutions uh, to the problems affecting our profession, let's start from the fact that when we grow up, we soon realize that law and justice are not synonyms, and illustrators' understanding of fair practice very often differs from what the market applies. It surely can be uh, a reality shock, especially for those who start their careers unprepared and thus um, have to move to in what is for them the uncharted territory of negotiation. As for many years, the illustration market has become global. It's now necessary to cooperate at an international level in order to share know-how and find common ways to respond to such a rapidly evolving work environment. Okay, as, as um, Derek previously said, EIF was founded actually in 2004, but in 2003, there was the first meeting, international meeting in Spain when illustrators, illustrators associations from all over Europe met and tried to uh, move the first steps in order to create an, um, a larger organization. So the keywords for the activities carried out by these associations and organizations is awareness. Raising awareness on both sides of those who create illustrations and those who need and use them is fundamental to have a common ground and a better work environment for all. The before mentioned issues and challenges uh, as emerging the recently completed EIF diversity survey are perceived by a large part of the illustrators community neg negatively as potential obstacles affecting their professional career and well being. These evidently include a gender based discrimination affecting female illustrators and a disparity in treatment in already perceived as a stagnating and stagnating fees. So as uh, Derek mentioned before, now I show you some images because these are nice. We carried out a, a sort of a series of uh, campaigns which were based to create awareness um, around Europe. So the first one was Price It Right. Then we had the Keep Your Copyright campaign. Then there was uh, a local nation, not national, local uh, Spanish uh, um, initiative, which is called the Ninja Guide for Illustrators, which was a funny booklet describing the world of illustration and ways to overcome issues related to negotiation, negotiation and uh, um, sometimes misunderstanding by part of uh, the commissioners of what illustrators' rights are. And then we have 
um, something like the resources offered by the AOI, the British Illustrators Association, which is a series of uh, information and models that can support an illustrator's career, um, especially when they had to try to work in an area where they never were before. Also, other associations have similar offer similar resources, but um, you have to check in each in each website to find what they offer. Okay, this is just a, a presentation, a general presentation. Then there are associations which occasionally produce the book, but, um, books where they. Um, described with the, the support of legal uh, and commercial and accountant advice um, books, which are guides to the profession, like this one, the white book created by the Spanish FEDIP, Federation of Illustrators FEDIP. This one, which has just been issued by the Illustrators platform in Turkey. And this elegant one, which is uh, was produced recently by the Illustratore organization organization in Germany. In Italy, we have also uh, a group on uh, Facebook where we just deal with uh, professional issues where experts, um, some are not even members of the association, some are publishers, are directors, photographers, lawyers. They respond to questions uh, posed by, by many illustrators which, who have doubts related to the, their activity. And then we have a model, uh, a very interesting um, experience, which is the one carried out by the uh, IAF, the International Authors Forum, which is an umbrella organization uh, that uh, is taking care of pro the protection of the rights of uh, hundreds of thousands of authors all around the world, which carries out a work which is very similar to what we uh, EI at EIF we do for illustration. So in um, a few years ago, they published this beautiful uh, 10 principles for fair contracts. And now we are going to read just the titles. If you go to the website, you just check international authors, you're going to find them, IAF international authors. You can find these uh, 10 principles, which are very clearly stated. It's, a, it's a, in themselves, they, um, they help understand very well what are the major issues related in, in contracts related, related to copyright assignment. So we have the contracts should not be forever. Artists should not share the success in the success of the creation. Artists' copyright should be respected. Party being granted the right must be must use it or lose it. Ensure artists, sorry, um, worker can reach the broadest possible audience, maximizing return for artists. Con uh, con uh, contractual commitment to protect and secure the works from unauthorized use. Safeguard the respect for authorship and the integrity of the works, safeguard at its future availability and the ability to work, clearly defined contract terms and uh, um, responsibilities with an agreed definition of vague terms like reasonable or non-commercial, a balance between risk and profit. Okay, for each of these terms, there is, a, there is an explanation of how clients often uh, face this issue and what we want uh, to offer as a, positive, constructive response. To end my presentation, I would like to begin to raise some awareness among this uh, excellent audience by reminding you that illustrators are part of the CCI, the cultural and creative industry, uh, which is protected under the 2005 UNESCO Convention on, on the Protection and Promotion of Cultural Diversity, which is also among the 17 goals of the 2030 UN Agenda for Sustainable Development. So in a few words, uh, as illustrators, we are a protected species and we should, let, uh, we, should, we should let our clients know about that because it's really important because uh, through awareness and knowledge comes respect. And uh, to end my, my presentation, I want to say we are all dinosaurs if compared to the potential of unregulated generative AI and uh, as we surely don't want to get extinct by these fascinating entities, so we better get together and transform a threat into a beneficial opportunity. That's why we must join forces in order to assess the situation together and, and reach constructively, constructively on the underlying issues just described here that affect negatively a wonderful job. So join your national association and support your uh, 
actions, their actions, our actions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paolo. That's uh, really interesting stuff. And it's it's good to have this understanding of running a business behind everything, because it, it's true that creative people often feel that the creation of the work is the most important thing. But of course, if you want to make some income and some money from your creative thing, then you've got to be running your, your business as a business and ensuring that you're thinking about fees and the position and respecting your own work and understanding its value. So great stuff. Thank you very much. Um, next up, we have Nergul uh, Shanape, and she will be talking about the different reactions um, uh, to AI developments from within the illustration community and thinking about how illustrators stay competitive whilst also passionately protecting their craft. So many thanks. Over to you, Nergul. Well, thank you, Derek. Um, let me share my screen as well. Well, first off, I'd like to welcome everyone. I am Nurgül, attending from Istanbul, Turkey. I'm the founding president of Illustrators Platform, as Derek mentioned, and a board member of EIF. Today in this webinar, I will be covering Illustrators' reactions and their perception of AI-generated art, supported with a survey, which we have very recently conducted, and probably some of you already participated in that survey. I will also go briefly on how AI has changed the landscape of art and illustration and why it is important for the illustrator, maintaining competence and adapting to the changing industry in this digital age. If I don't exceed my time, I like to step, step into very briefly the feature of illustration as general predictions and the strategies for the illustrators to stay competitive and creative. Let me share my screen now. Um, can you see my presentation? I'm using two screens. OK, perfect. So um, as you can see in my agenda, I'll uh, go through mainly for the first item and cover up a little bit second item. And if I have some time left, I'll go through with the third item and I will be sharing with you the survey results and we'll go through with them together. Yes. And how AI has changed the landscape of art and illustration. I pointed out some items here. We can, of course, extend it items, but I try to uh, stay focused on certain uh, points. Those are very important for the time being. Imagine a world where the very essence of an artist's creation could be shaped by anyone, anywhere, any scale, and without their consent. It is happening, actually, at the moment. It's a feature that challenges the very foundations of artistic expansions and intellectual property as we know it. The stark reality is that in this age of AI, copyright alone may not be the fortress we once thought it to be. Legal process, probably you all can keep an, uh, the, those who are following what is happening in the world uh, art industry at the moment, the legal process uh, is really having a hard time and naturally cannot keep up with the speed of technology. This is the main problem we are facing today. There are no guarantees that copyright will be enough sufficient to protect artists from AI training, assuming it will take longer time than it requires. And there's a need for that. While the legal battles over the fate of copyrighted works unfold beyond our control, what we do have in our power is the ability to pioneer a new era of collaborative and consent-driven interactions with artist data. A new era offers us the opportunity to reconfigure how we treat IP, our IPs. 
We believe that the best path forward is to offer individual artists tools to manage their style and likenessness and determine their own comfort level with a changing technology landscape. I need to mention one thing here that our focus is not on stifling creativity on pursuing individuals for experimenting with the works of others or there are many artists now who is using AI start doing personalized AI generative uh, uh, generative AI. So inst instead our concern centers around the industrial scale of artist training data where the lines between inspiration and uh, appreciation blur. Now when we take a look into initial reaction and perception of illustrators on AI, we notice that there are still a lot of artists who don't have the necessary awareness that AI is entering as a mainstream and the impact of AI generated art brings to art world and the art artists' professional lives. As EIF, we took initiative to do many events to create awareness among artists while we are united with many other societies and associations around the world and taking necessary actions on this matter. Upcoming slides, I will be sharing the result of our survey. But before, I would like to share my findings while reading the survey result and of course enriched with my research on this matter. There is a fix uh, there is a mix of feelings about AI in art. I'm sure when you're chatting with your teammates, friends in the uh, creative industries who is taking part, we all have those ups and downs um, and, and confusions. Um, so we've, we found out that there are still a lot of mixed feelings about AI in art, including uncertainty, curiosity, concerns about creativity and ethics. Illustrators, artists also face technical challenges, but so opportunities for collaborating and experimenting with AI as well. We can say there are complexity of illustrators' reactions and perceptions. It's essential to acknowledge the diverse range of perspe perspectives within, uh, within the artistic community and how these perspectives have evolved over time. Let's explore the initial reactions and perceptions of illustrators a little more deeper. Um, when I pointed out those um, items here, um, I covered uh, around 14 uh, main points and one of the number one was skepticism and concerns among um, artistic community. Many illustrators initially viewed AI-generated art with skepticism and concern. Skepticism, sorry, I am having a hard time pronouncing it right. Skepticism and concern. They worried that AI might replace human artists and diminish the value of their skills. The second top point was fear of job displacement. Illustrators were concerned that the rise of AI in art might lead to job displacements, which we are actually hearing uh, in different marketplaces. This has started already. As some routine and repetitive tasks could be automated, potentially reducing the demand for human illustrators. The third point was curiosity. Some, illustrator, some illustrators were curious about the possibilities AI offered. They saw AI as a tool that could enhance their creative process and open up new artistic avenues. And there's always this mixed emotions. Many illustrators had feeling both excited and apprehensive about the integration of AI into their work. They were interested in exploring AI's potential, but were also cautious about its limitations. So some illustrators embraced AI as a collaborative partner rather than a threat. They saw opportunity to work alongside AI tools, leveraging their expertise to guide and refine AI gener uh, generated elements. When we look at the adaptation and learning part, forward thinking, illustrators recognize 
the need to adapt and learn how to use AI tools effectively. They understood that staying updated with technological advancements was essential to remaining competitive. Of course, there are ethical and artistic concerns will take place for some time. Illustrators raised ethical questions about AI-generated art, including issues related to intellectual property, originality, the authenticity of art produced by machines. Artistic freedom versus automation and artistic identity and style. When we take a deep look into that part, some illustrators felt torn between the desire for artistic freedom and the convenience of autom uh, automation. They had to strike a balance between maintaining their artistic integrity and using AR for efficiency. Illustrators grappled with maintaining their unique artistic identity and style while incorporating AI into their work. And there has been some emotional connections as well. Illustrators highlighted the emotional connections that we were often have with handmade or human created art emphasizes that AI generated art might lack the same emotional depth and renaissance. Over time, as illustrators gain more experience with AI, their attitude evolved. Many began to appreciate AI as a valuable tool that could enhance their work, save time, and enable them to explore new creative possibilities. Um, besides what I've been pointing out, there are a few additional points to consider when discussing the initi uh, initial reactions and perception of illustrators, which I would like to share with you as well. Uh, what is in terms of technical skills and learning curve, many illustrators initially felt overwhelmed by the technical aspects of using AI tools. They had to invest time and effort in learning how to operate these tools effectively. There are concerns about artistic authenticity, and some illustrators questioned whether AI-generated art could be considered automatic or truly artistic. They pondered the role of humanity crea uh, human creativity and emotions in art compared to AI's algorithmic output. We know that there are collaborations with AI developers taking place too. Some illustrators sought, meaning wanted, uh, collaboration with AI de uh, developers and researchers to provide input and feedback on AI tools. Aiming to shape these technologies to a better suite, the need of artists, and of course, ethical concerns extended to do responsible and fair use of AI in art. Illustrators discussed the importance of acknowledging the source of AI generated elements and respecting copyright and intellectual property rights. Forward thinking, illustrators recognize the potential for using AI generated art as a springboard for artistic experimentation. They explored ways to incorporate AI generated elements into their works as a meant of pushing creative boundaries. For instance, making art task got easier. AI can help with boring and repetitive things like coloring, resizing, removing backgrounds. So artists can focus on the fun and creative parts. Creating art with AI uh, helps artists to generate art based on different styles and ideas. Uh, it's like having an a, uh, AI art assistant on your desk. Trying new style much easier and even fun, some illustrator says. AI can take an artwork and change style, which lets artists experiment with different looks. Like Tobias was mentioning at his uh, presentation, some of them actually refers to his presentation here. Editing Find details now much faster. Uh, patterns, textures, uh, texture, uh, textures without artists having to do all the work. And of course, it makes some saving on time and money. Um, but while AI offers many benefits to artists and illustrators, to do their art more easily and gives them new ways to be creative, it is important to emphasize that it is a tool to 
augment creativity, not replace it. Artists still bring uni unique perspectives, emotions, storytelling abilities that AI cannot replace. Therefore, it's crucial for um, all of us to embrace AI as a tool to enhance uh, artistic works rather than looking at it in a perception of replacement. We need to keep in mind the use of AI in art still raises questions about intellectual property rights, copyright issues, ethical concerns regarding originality, authorships. And when AI is used in art, there can be questions about who owns the art and if it's been consent from uh, original artist uh, from its own um, copyright owner and if it's okay to use it. There are important things to think about. I would like to get onto my survey. The survey particip participated countries about 13. We want to continue on the survey after this webinar as well. Uh, so if you could spread around your community and friends, it would be giving us good um, feedback for all of us to extend our um, work we are doing as a community for illustrators. So we, uh, we have participants from 13 countries. Um, participant age um, ranges about 16, uh, 18 to 65. Number of participants um, attended to survey is about 300. And one third is from local uh, Turkish market and uh, one fourth is from uh, Europe. Participants profile majority is illustrators. Uh, graphic designers, artists, um, but there are some lecturers, academicians uh, from universities, writers, publishers, art directors, students. Uh, so we have variety of participants from different profiles. We can see the age range. Um, I especially wanted to uh, put two different markets. Um, as I said, we want to continue to do this uh, survey or similar one um, on continuous basis to keep an eye uh, on the marketplace. Uh, when I put these two pages together, we can see, depending on, uh, there's a, uh, there are variations in opinions based on the country, culture, age groups. That's what I wanted to show you here. Additionally, uh, another crucial point that I it got in my uh, attention while I, I was studying on this survey was um, participants, majority of them haven't yet started using artificial intelligence, yet they tend to have either very positive or very negative perspectives. So let's take a look at it together. Um, I'm using two screens, so um, yeah, let me go there. Um, I noticed that the most common age was um, 23, 25, 33, 35. But when I look at the Europe, the most common age was 30, 40, 43. The, the range of the ages was both the same, 18 to 61, 62. So one of our question was, how long have you been working professionally in art or illustration? So when we look at the Europe, um, the, the, the major uh, participants actually has experience um, more than 10 years. So it's 10 to 15 years to more than 15 years has the majority of the attendees. When we look at the uh, local market, uh, it's right opposite, actually one to five years um experienced professionals has attended to the um survey no cool. so, sorry sorry to interrupt you've got about two minutes left so maybe if we okay jump, maybe, yeah thanks so instead of me explaining all these graphics we can share that later i can go very briefly um and show you the graphic shapes 
Um, so among the participants, you can see usually it's Europe or local market. I make the, um, the um, uh, separate definitions and put the uh, results together. Um, some parts, uh, Europe sees it more threat. Um, here, it's right opposite in local market. Um, they don't see it as a threat. 77% sees it as an opportunity. Um, when we look at the um, European market, it says, is it mostly positive or neg negative, the impact of AI? Uh, mostly it says negative in Europe, which is more experienced in the illustration market um, audience. And when we look at the local market, mainly it says um, positive, almost 70%, almost similar. Um, so when we look at, uh, have you personally used AI art generators for creating art or illustrations? Um, this is basic, pretty much the same in both markets. The majority of participants, both, they have not used AI or experienced AI yet. Um, so this says, which type of uh, AI uh, art generator do you use more often? Custom trained or pre-trained? Both. Uh, mostly it says, uh, I don't use AI. And other than that, pre-trained. So they've been using other artists' work when they are working on AI. Um, And how do you feel about using AI art generate uh, art generators in your art? And mostly your part, it says they have doubts and they don't use AI, but uh, majority says easy to use, easy to learn. Uh, and some of them says it kills the creativity. And then we look at the local market, the younger generation, they are quite um, exciting and they think it's uh, useful and they, don't, they say they don't have doubts. And as I mentioned, you know, previously on my uh, speech, it gives us the hints, the survey about the main perception and the awareness level of the illustrators in the marketplace. Um, the another question was, please rate your proficiency in using AI. Uh, you can see the figures here again. Um, and no, what is the source? Can I, sorry, can I interrupt? Um, can this be the last slide? Because I want to make sure there's time for our other two speakers, yeah? Yeah. Thank you. So learn art, AI art, AI generators. You can see the figures here again. And do you think this is a very important question? Using AI generated art for commercial gain goes against copyright law. Uh, the majority says they have no idea. And some part says no. So it again shows in the marketplace, there's a big uh, gap in terms of awareness of what we are stepping into with this AI generated art. There were some comments from uh, survey participants, so I will just skip that. Um, yeah, if anybody has any questions, and these are our websites, uh, you'll have more information about European Guild for Artificial Intelligence Regulations. And I'm done with my presentation. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And sorry for having to shorten things a bit, but that's all really fascinating stuff. And it's it's good to bring up all these. It was it was challenging for me to to stick up with the, all these results on the survey and keep up with it 20 minutes. Yeah, uh, sorry for for problems. yeah. But we'll hopefully be able to make this information available maybe on the EIF website. Yes, we can, we will. Yeah. Probably with the audio recording, we can provide this so everybody can have a deeper look in it. The yeah. more dig in, you get more uh, awareness about what the marketplaces and the different perceptions and the awareness level of the artist. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Brilliant. It's, I, I love seeing, hearing all these different perspectives. It's it's really useful for us, the whole audience thing to see all these different ideas and also what other people are thinking. It's 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 really important. Thank you so much. That was great. Mm -hmm. Um, next, I would like to bring on Anna Karina Birkenstock, and she'll be giving us an overview of the legal issues surrounding generative AI, um, plus looking at the initiatives of creator organizations around Europe 
um, to help protect illustrators' rights. So Anna Karina, if we can. Yeah, thank you, Derek. Uh, so I must say I'm more a lawyer. So um, uh, I will give you a quick overview, uh, overview, but I'm not the expert if you have any legal Qu uh, deep dive questions. <laughs> so um, actually, uh, I want to give you a quick overview of how um, where the problems are, the legal problems, and of course for us the problems where we uh, don't get money for things, and where the EU AI Act is uh, heading, uh, which will be probably um, discussed by the end of the year and then be put into law. Um, Tobias explained to you that we need a lot of data to do AI, to do um, machine learning. And where does the data come from? From you, from the internet. And uh, you see here all the happy artists who show their work in the internet. And um, so everyone can take them. And especially in the European Union, we have uh, the um, text and data mining uh, law that allows companies to mine, so to, to get uh, images and text from the internet uh, for research purposes. Um, so it's perfectly, it was perfectly legal for a company like Leon AI, which is situated in Germany, to get all the 5 billion or 6 billion, I don't know, uh, images to train the um, uh, artificial intelligence. Um, so now then they sold their data set to Stable Diffusion um, and they are stating on their website that you can um, create an image with Stable Diffusion and this um, image is automatically under the Creative Commons license. So you, um, it's a public domain uh, license. So you have no exclusive rights on this image. So this is the state which is now on the, the website. Uh, so if you go to Stable Diffusion and create an image, um, you have no exclusive rights, but of course you can use it for, I don't know, the cover of your self-written um, novel and sell this self-written novel on the internet. Uh, so you have actually um, the possibility to earn money with this picture, even if you don't have an exclusive right. Uh, in Germany, it's pretty clear that uh, an artificial intelligence created image does not have a copyright at all. So um, somebody uses like a picture which uh, from a machine which has learned making pictures with your artwork and you don't get any money from it, from it. So the question is, it doesn't sound right, right? There must be some laws against that because you show your image in the internet to get like seen, to get money, and somebody uses this, hmm, is this legal or is it not? <laughs> so um, the, 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 the thing is that um, Leon AI, AI used it for um, research purposes, but Stable Diffusion is a company who earns money. So hmm, there are some laws missing here. Um, the question is, who gets the money, as I said? <laughs> and of course, you don't get it. But the user who um, wants to create an image doesn't get money either because uh, having a prompt is not um, copyright worthy yet. So if he, the user has an idea and prompts something, you cannot put this under a copyright. Uh, the software company is actually uh, busy with some other stuff. Um, they are more making money with like uh, specific solutions for greater customers, so they don't care. Um, but we have this image and it um, apparently has no copyright and that doesn't seem very um, like a problem now. So, um, of course, creative uh, people now think, well, <laughs> we will lose our jobs. We don't get money. So there are some uh, points at which you can now sue some people. And, uh, and I will show you some example of uh, what uh, lawsuits has been made in the US. 
uh, in the US because they have a different copyright law. And afterwards, I will show you um, the uh, EU AI Act and what they are trying to do right now and what they are not uh, doing. Uh, so, you, uh, as Tobias showed you the process of training the data. So, at first, you need all these pictures. Then, uh, the AI company is copying these pictures into their pr training program. Um, it is then, um, as Tobias explained, um, used to train the machine. And then afterwards, as you see there, uh, they throw the pictures away. They don't need them anymore because the AI is trained. Um, but they have copied these pictures. And some um, smart uh, US uh, creative said, well, this copying of copyrighted material is against the law. So, so there, because copyright means you cannot copy it, and they copied it, even though they throw it away. But this is only in the US, because in Germany, uh, as I pointed out, in, in Europe, uh, you have the, uh, the right to data mine if you throw the data away and anonymize it. So um, all the rest is perfectly safe, but in the end, we have an image. So this image can be very close to a picture an actual artist might have been uh, made. So you cannot sue the user who did the image, uh, but you can tell the company, well, you enabled somebody to make a picture which looks just like mine, and it can be mistaken for my picture. So um, uh, the user, of course, doesn't know if he does a picture, if this picture already exists in a, a certain way. And the question is, can the AI create a picture which is so similar to an actually exist, existing picture that um, it is it can be mistaken and is therefore under the copyright law? I show you the example, what kind of um, uh, lawsuits have been uh, made. Uh, of course, at first, <laughs> the first people to sue were the um, coders. As you might know, in ChatGPT, you can also um, create code. And uh, numerous coders um, sued GitHub, Microsoft, and OpenAI uh, for um, um, using their code. Because GitHub is a platform where you have open source code. Everyone can use it. And um, Microsoft used this open source code to create code, which uh, Microsoft licensed. So uh, Microsoft actually made money with it. And so, so it's the other way around. Um, then um, artists um, sued as well. Um, several artists said, well, um, this um, um, pictures which are created can be mistaken for our works, which, which um, can damage can damage our um, reputation. Um, maybe you know that in the copyright law, you cannot copyright style. So if I say in the style of Van Gogh and he was still alive, he cannot say, well, this is in my style and this is um, uh, against the copyright because style is not um, protectable. But if somebody um, creates a work and does it mainly badly, as we see here with Getty images, the AI was trained with Getty images. And if you ever went on the platform and uh, looked at Getty images, they always have their watermark in their picture. So the AI was trained that really great pictures always have this Getty watermark in them and uh, gave you photographs with a slightly bended, strange looking Getty watermark. Uh, so Getty sued Stability AI for damaging their reputation because you saw like slightly distorted photographs with they're not even like right with, you know, at first the AI didn't know how to do fingers, uh, but it had the Getty watermark on it. Um, so this is the way you can you can sue them if you say you think your, your reputation is damaged. Um, authors, text authors also sued um, OpenAI 
um, because um, they scraped a lot of books from the uh, from the internet. Um, some of them were not even like most of them were copyrighted before, and um, that also helps, of course, if like famous people sue somebody like Sage Silverman. She's an author and comedian and uh, she um, sued Meta and OpenAI for using her text. Um, Googlebot was a suit. Um, Googlebot is um, chat GPT from Google was sued by various anonymous people uh, because they assumed that Google is using their personal data. So this is happening in the US. But um, here in the EU, we have different laws. So of course we have seen the problem. The European countries have seen the problem and they said, well, we need uh, laws to protect us from uh, artificial intelligence. And at first they rated the risk you have with artificial intelligence. There's an unacceptable risk, um, which is um, direct manipulation of behavior especially uh, to protect children. Uh, social scoring is an unacceptable risk, which I find very, <laughs> um, very good <laughs> so that we don't get social scoring here. And uh, the biometric identification systems, of course, um, are unacceptable if you like cannot get into a country because the AI decides that you look uh, or makes a mistake. Uh, the next level is a high risk. Uh, this is for all transportational devices like uh, cars and lifts, but also for education um, and uh, migration issues. Uh, and then we have the limited risks. And there the EU states, well, we need um, to make sure that the users um, can make informed decisions so that we always know this is an artificial intelligence and uh, I can decide whether I want it or not. So where to put the generative AI? It's kind of in its old field. They don't know what kind of risk it will be. So they have an own section for generative AI. And of course it has to, um, respect the laws that are, are existing. So the companies have to make sure that generative AI does not create works which are directly copyrighted. So um, they have to make sure. So, but the question is, as I stated earlier, we already have cases where there are images that they are so close to the original. So uh, you cannot decide whether is it um, the original picture or the artificial intelligence one. Um, so this is the first requirement they have. And um, it would like go under the low um, risk. So we want users to decide whether they want artificial intelligence or not. Um, so uh, this would mean that uh, generative AI designed pictures had to be marked so that we can make a decision. Um, and they are also looking into the um, training data. So we will have laws that um, will define whether the training data um, has to be um, co um, copyrighted for, by the company. Um, just uh, okay. <laughs> so sorry, I just uh, had like a blackout. <laughs> um, the um, question is now: um, Where does the uh, AI Act focus? And the focus, uh, uh, the AI Act focuses clearly on the users. So uh, the users from pictures need to be protected from breaking the law, from making uh, they have to have the right decision. They are not focusing on the creative people. But as we have learned from Paolo, we are pr pr protected species. Um, and therefore, um, all the illustrators and creative organization um, have um, their own campaign um, getting the EU's focus on 
the creators as well. Uh, in Germany, we have um, a campaign called AI But Fair. And um, the demands are not only the labeling, but also the, um, the protection of the creatives uh, and to make the training data transparent, uh, which is also uh, already in the EUI Act. Uh, but also the focus is on appreciation, on protection and promotion of human uh, creativity. So uh, of course the EU law doesn't uh, focus on cultural aspects, but the, uh, as Paolo pointed out, the uh, UNESCO does. So um, we have like two different things. The one, the, I say, well, the, the dry legal side of things, um, and the one, what do we want? What, uh, what is um, uh, desirable for our creativity? So um, in many European countries, uh, many uh, organizations have started similar campaigns um, because the first reading of the um, A uh, EU AI Act was like recently in June. And uh, now it's the work of the parliament to read over it and to get different opinion. And the um, act should be uh, finished in end of the year. So we still have some time to uh, talk to politicians. And this is uh, the point where you all come in <laughs> and we'll lead over to Francesco um, because um, we need you all to get into your national um, organizations and to support uh, the illustrators and the creative um, authors um, to become a loud voice to uh, emphasize that it's not only for uh, about law and protection and decision, but also a cultural decision. What do we want to do with um, illustrators? How do we want to express ourselves? Uh, and how do we want uh, to, um, the people to be aware of creativity works of humans versus the creativity work of uh, machines? So I would like then to talked um, to lead over to France Francesco, uh, who will talk about the European Guild uh, for in artificial, artificial Intelligence Regulation uh, and his um, uh, campaigning, Europe-wide campaigning uh, for the illustrator's rights. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna Karina. That's an um, excellent overview of what's what's going on. And you've saved me having to introduce uh, Francesco. He's, he's already got it. It's already there rolling. Um, have you got a presentation, Francesco? Yes, I'm sharing yeah. the screen right now and right. I should be able to present it. Okay. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Derek. Um, okay, so I'll just start immediately and, and I'll try to stay under 50 minutes. I've set my timer. Uh, so today I'd like to talk to you about uh, Egair, uh, so our work, but also the main obstacles we are facing. Uh, luckily, Tobias spoke about Glaze. So uh, and also, by the way, thank you for your excellent presentation, Tobias. It was really, very insightful and interesting. So Egair. Uh, Egair is the European Guild for AI Regulation. Uh, we are uh, a network of associations and creatives from all over Europe. Uh, we have a website, which is www.egair.eu, uh, which you can, where you can read our manifesto and find all useful links uh, regarding our activities and how you can help us. Uh, so what do we do? We, well, we lobby uh, at the EU level and also at the national level uh, for the protection of creatives, uh, in particularly focusing on uh, the AI Act. We have started working uh, in well, officially in January uh, 2023, but we had begun working before that in October 2022, uh, writing the manifesto and figuring out what we needed to do. Our main focus was and is the AI Act, because when we started working, uh, I'll be quick on this because I'm already explained this, uh, but when we started working uh, on the AI Act wasn't really concerned uh, with the uh, rights of creatives and artists. The AI Act was meant to protect users. Uh, in general, the AI Act had been in the works for three years at that point. 
And everyone we talked with, uh, all the politicians, all the members of the European Parliament, uh, they were all adamant in not changing it and having it pass by February uh, as it was. So without any reference to generative AI and artists and creatives in general. Uh, this all changed in the span of a month because in February, uh, by that point, ChatGPT had become really popular and the politicians realized that they had to do something. So the AI Act changed into a more horizontal document uh, dealing with a lot of different uh, things, all related to AI. It is, in many ways, a superficial document that doesn't go in depth on a lot of things. And we are trying to work and change that to make it more strong as a form of protection. But at least it deals with artists and creators in at least some way. Uh, we managed to, to our meetings with members of the parliament, we managed to sneak in Article 28 bit which is the one that deals with, uh, that asks for uh, AI providers to offer, at, at this point, a summary of the copyright content they used in their training data. We are now working on having this summary becoming a complete uh, list of all the copyright items used. Um, so of course the act is our main focus and will be probably our main focus during the next this year and the next year when it will, when all the different governments of Europe will have to turn it into national laws, basically. Uh, we managed to do something, but we need to do more. We are also working on reporting AI companies. If you read our manifesto, you'll see that we our main our focus is on copyright, but also on privacy rights. So we're working with uh, privacy with the European agencies for privacy and data protection, and we are starting to report stability AI at this point, because the stability has the data set that can be checked, which is Lion 5B. Uh, so we're also working on that. And we also work with other uh, group of interests worldwide, other associations and agencies to have um, to coordinate the fight and have all the, everyone on the same uh, positions and to exchange resources. So we work with the Concept Art Association, uh, which is the American Association, are the collective Arte as Etica. And we're also working with uh, people from Japan and in Jap the Japan Japanese government to make sure that the battle is fought everywhere uh, in the same way. So how do we do it? Uh, we work with uh, Vera Studio, which is a lobbying agency, a communication agency. They are Italian and they had previous experiences in lobbying for creative rights. They managed to pass some laws in Italy that protect actors and guarantees that they get uh, rights uh, from platforms such as Netflix. Uh, we pay Vera thanks to a fundraising campaign that is currently going on on GoFundMe. You can find the link on our website. Uh, we have at this point raised 50,000 euros, which is a lot. Uh, it helped it help us cover the first year of work, but since we expect to have more years of work in the future, uh, we hope that we can raise more. So if if you can, uh, please donate and help us because we need we need a lot of help. All the money go to Vera. We don't see anything for us. It's just activism, but we need to pay for our agents. So let's talk about opt out. I wanted to talk about opt out because it's one of the main obstacles we face uh, when trying to get more protections for artists. Uh, in Europe and specifically in the AI Act. Uh, first, a general definition. Uh, Opt-out is opposed to opt-in. Opt-in means that uh, a user can ask to be included in something. Opt-out means that the user is by default included in something and has to withdraw their consent. Uh, when talking about generative AI, we we talk about opt-in and opt-out uh, uh, in reference to data sets. So uh, opt-out means that the AI companies have scraped the internet with uh, from taking all the data they could find, and now people can opt out in theory and ask them to remove this data from the data sets. This in theory, this is um, ethically questionable in a lot of ways, of course, because it means that. Well, the key principle of opt-in is the consent, of course, while the opt-out is the opposite of consent, is consent by default. Uh, and it also puts a, a heavy burden on the artist or, uh, or on the user that has to search 
you usually use data databases of images to find their image uh, or save their image in a specific way and make sure that everyone that uploads their image online has been mm -hmm. sorry someone called me and I was connected here uh so then uh okay perfect sorry about that uh, so the, um, so it, it, it's not easy to do that. Uh, websites that allow to do that, such as have I been trained, don't really work. Uh, in fact, uh, yeah, quite the opposite. Uh, they are really difficult to navigate and it's a really time consuming activity. Furthermore, uh, opt out doesn't work if the data had already has already been used by AI companies. Uh, the machine, machine learning is impossible. So if someone has used your data, you can opt out from the other set, but at that point, the machine learning process had already uh, was already done, and so there is nothing you can do about that. And finally, we have no guarantees that it works. Have I been trained? Claims that the Stability AI uh, acknowledges opt out requests and takes out from the data set opt out uh, opt opted out images, but we are not sure of that. Furthermore, um, Stability AI is the only company that does that. Uh, OpenAI, Midjourney, they don't even care about that. So it's really not working. So, okay, why does it matter? It matters because it's a, it's a part of the EU legislation and that's our problem. The opt-out was uh, designed and is featured in the Copyright Directive from 2019. The Copyright Directive features two exceptions to opt-out. Uh, in the articles three and four. The first one is the article three uh, about research. So what Anna was uh, talking about earlier, uh, for research purposes, uh, data can be scraped and used for training uh, without uh, care, care for uh, copyright, which is what Lion has been doing. But article four talks also of commercial use for scraping. Uh, so uh, there is an exception to copyright for commercial use. The only limits to these exceptions are, uh, well, first of all, that, uh, that the uh, reproductions and the reproduction extractions of the works uh, is from accessible, lawfully accessible sources. And this is relevant when we talk about OpenAI and the fact that they uh, had uploaded a website uh, with millions of uh, pirated books, basically. But also the exception doesn't apply if the owner uh, 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 of the data has expressed their opt-out in a machine-readable way. So the, the bot that scrapes the internet has to be able to read that some read that an image on a website uh, is uh, has been opted out. And in theory, it's not allowed to scrape it and download it. Um, so what are the problems with this? Well, first of all, the copyright directive is from 2019 and was, uh, well, uh, it's from uh, even earlier than that. 2019 was when it uh, was finally voted, uh, which means that it's completely outdated as, at this point and inadequate. The idea of opt out was meant as something that would benefit the general public. And so something that was meant to, as, uh, as it says here, acquire new knowledge and facilitate the discovery of new trends. It wasn't meant to help uh, private companies to get richer in the way the, these AI companies are doing. Uh, there's, it's not clear what machine readable means, again, so uh, there's not a clear definition of that. In theory, images, uh, AIs and bots should be able to read, for example, the C of copyright on an image. Does that work? Is that enough? Apparently not, because uh, as we all know, uh, some of these uh, AIs spit out works that have usually uh, the um, get the images logos all blurred. So they 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 took they take those. Uh, is it possible that something machine readable could be a header that's written in the image when uploaded online? Uh, but we know that a lot of websites don't uh, care about that. Uh, so there are websites that say that they have opt-out options, but actually they host images on other websites that don't, don't have opt-outs. And also uh, uh, an artist usually don't have, doesn't have control on how other people upload their images online. Since uh, bots usually scrape uh, from e-shops and e-stores, 
uh, well, it's it's impossible to have control on how a publisher uh, uploads your image on Amazon or how someone uploads a picture of a book on eBay, for example. Uh, so this is a problem, of course, because when we one of the key points we are trying to pass in Europe is that AI companies should have to ask consent before using someone's data, and of and in theory also make maybe li licenses with artists and similar. And it is difficult to do that because, of course, everyone tells us that this is not uh, something that the copyright directive. Uh, uh, foresees the copyright directive says that there is opt out. The opt out is the opposite of consent. Uh, everyone in Europe acknowledges that this is an inadequate and outdated thing that needs to be reworked. And there are people that are reworking it uh, in the, at the EU Commission level. But the AI Act, as it stands, cannot deal with it in theory. So is it all lost? Uh, well, no, uh, otherwise we won't be uh, working on uh, lobbying. Uh, us, Ovegair, and also other groups representing other creatives from all Europe, we are lobbying to uh, make people at the EU Commission realize that these companies are not really respecting the copyright directive and the exceptions. This, the uh, why? Well, because the copyright directive comes from the Berne Convention. The Berne Convention, it specifically refers to the Berne Conventions. And the Berne Conventions talk about copyright exceptions. The, the Berne Convention says the copyright exceptions must adhere to, three to a three-step test. And one of the steps is that uh, the use of data, uh, so the exception doesn't apply if the data, if the data that has been scraped are used in a way that uh, prejudice the legitimate interest of the original right holder. So if uh, a company takes an image that has not been opted out and uses it uh, of someone and uses it to uh, basically make that, pe that person lose their job, they are not respecting the Berne Convention and the copyright exception doesn't apply to that. Furthermore, there's also um, another important point the, yeah, the directive uh, of 29 from 2001 says specifically that copyright exceptions have still have to be anyway adequately compensated for uh, so AI companies should still compensate people whose data they scrape. Uh, the problem is that the article three from the directive claims that all the arms uh, that uh, any right holders would suffer through the exception uh, would be minimal. Because as we said, the copyright directive came in way before generative AI as we know them. Uh, this is a problem. Uh, and so we are working at the European level to make sure that institutions understand this, that these AI companies and their business models aren't uh, complying to European laws, European requirements for transparency. Uh, to make sure that even if we can pass Okay, my timer is on, so we are at 15 minutes. 15 minutes. So even if we can have an AI act that deals with consent right now, uh, at least we can make sure that by using courts and tribunals, uh, we can make these companies pay for what they have been doing. We will be able to do that once the AI act passes and we have uh, requirements for transparency uh from these uh, ai companies uh we know also that these ai companies are, are not really liking these uh, um changes in the AI act we know that they have been complaining a lot with uh, europe and institutions uh because they don't want to offer even summaries of what copyright content they have used uh because also it will mean bad for them also when dealing with uh, americans mm, but we of course we don't care about that we are happy that they don't like what we've been doing and we plan to keep doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, so please, if you can help us, uh, look at our website and and that's it. Um, I had to run a little bit, but um, I think we are in time and maybe there's time for some questions. Yes, there is some time. Thank you very much for keeping that nice and trimmed at 15 minutes. That's great. Um, yeah, it's and it's well, and also kind of thank you on behalf of uh, everyone in Europe for what um, AGR is doing because it's and I think we're all working independently. Sadly, in the UK, we we can't be do, 
coming in on this uh, European act. Um, but it's very encouraging that you're working so hard and tirelessly, it seems, on getting all this um, done. So big thank you to that. Um, we have, well, actually, well, the first question probably is, relates to you, Francesco. It's someone to, asking about text that you might be able to put on your website that would stop bots reading it. So they're saying, if text saying this, um, is this useful to protect copyright material? So the quote would be, the use of any of the creative materials found on this website to train, test, or improve any artificial intelligence model is strictly prohibited. Mm, yeah, the thing is, is that machine readable? Does the machine yeah. read that? Does that work? Uh, even Facebook uh, Meta has been doing something similar recently where you can write them and ask them to opt out from, uh, to have your data opted out uh, from their training of AIs. It, it only relates to data acquired um, through third parties, so not metadata. But does that work as well? Uh, like it, it's difficult. Uh, opt out, it's, well, these companies have not been using it in a really good and transparent way. The thing is that people at EU level have realized that, and so they are, well, they're not happy with, with this. So I don't know if, I don't think that writing that really helps you on a, on a website. It's better to use probably headers that uh, are machine readable. Even if companies ignore them, at least they have a, something that in theory is machine readable and that can, uh, that in the future, maybe can be used in a court of law or similar. Yeah, because actually in the UK, we were advised by a lawyer that having this kind of wording in, a t in your terms and conditions of your website, well, it's kind of as much you can do almost. Um, and But it's worth still putting that there. So if you need to point to it in the future, um, it's worth worth having that. Um, Just uh, I mentioned uh, the best form of protection, Tobias talk, uh, talked about that, is definitely glaze. So glaze your images uh, on X, uh, on Meta, post only glazed images, uh, and that's the best way to do that. Yeah. So that, that's a safe protection. Yeah, so that's worth exploring. My understanding is it can take a while to do things, but obviously it's worth looking at how you can, um, how you can, how you can get those images protected. Um, and uh well we've got a question from b willie saying are there any guidelines or advice for machine readable wording available i suppose the question is how does that look what 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 would it look like in terms of being on a website do you know uh i it, uh, it's an header that you have to uh, it's uh, it depends on how you save the image i don't, i don't know how to explain it right now uh i think it yeah it's worth to probably uh Follow a guy on Instagram and we'll try to work on a post to have guidelines that explains how to use them. I, I, as of now, I can't explain it properly. No. And then to make sure that because it's it's lines of code that you have to write into the image, basically. Uh, we'll try to have a, a guide for that. And yeah, it's worth doing that for sure. Yes, yeah, so something needs something that needs looking at. So just a reminder to everyone, if you've got a question for a general question or a specific question for any of our guests please type that into the, the Q&A, um, which is um, at the bottom of your screen next to um, raise hand. So if you want to ask us a question, please put something in there. There's been a huge amount uh, to sort of take in today, but I think it's been really valuable having all these different spectres and looking at these different sets of everything. So looking at the legal aspects, um, what, what uh, groups like ADR are doing, um, how individuals are reacting as Nurgle's um, pointed to us. Um, but also it's great from Paolo hearing about, well, what it has been like, what might be coming up down the line. And of course, both the main issues, the unauthorized use of our images and the legal sort of implications of all that, um, and how AI will impact the illustration industry through its use by illustrators and potentially clients are things that are going to play out over time but at that time might be quite short we don't know how you know it's it's there's legislation moving but legislation always works much more slowly than the companies who are whizzing ahead with um making their generative uh, sites attractive to people um we've got a question here from ko asking um who do we have to follow on instagram to see those guidelines to protect your images um well, we, if we get some guidelines, we will put them on the EIF website. Um, maybe that's something that we can all look into potentially as um, organisations. We haven't currently got those to hand, but we'll look into getting that. Um, 
Another question from um, one of our attendees who's saying, thank you, Francesco. Besides Glaze, can't I just send myself my idea illustration via mail? And from this moment on, it's saved and a later very similar AI copy can be um, sued. Another question, how can I even identify the AI who copied my illustration? Is there an artist name written like artist specific AI company? What, I'm not quite sure I understand that. What happens if I would copy AI for making, for example, fun of it? Is it protected? It's not a species, is it? Um, well, as, as um, actually Anna Karina pointed out, there is no copyright in artificially uh, created images. So no one can stop you doing anything with a, an, an AI generated image. Um, I'm not, um, I think sending yourself, well, Francesca, I don't know if you have the answer to this, but I would say sending yourself a pi picture doesn't really help in terms of an um, AI generated artwork looking like yours on the whole. Um, Anna Karina talked about this, didn't you? Maybe that's something you can talk about, but it's it's the style of your work. It's, I think it's fairly, in my understanding, it's fairly unlikely that an image that really looks exactly like one of yours is likely to be generated by AI. Unless you are you are Steve McCurry and you are talking about uh, yeah. like Afghan girl, of course. So uh, since uh, AI's work uh, on statistical parameters, if your image is heavily featured online, probably yes, something similar will come out. Uh, but not not really. I, I'd say glaze it doesn't work to to for, um, in order to make lawsuits in the future. Glaze works so that your image cannot be used in the training of an AI. And in fact, what what Glaze does is basically make the AI uh, degenerate in a way. It interferes with the machine learning uh, uh, process, basically. So it, that's the kind of protect. That's the kind of protection that it offers. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, no, it's it's really difficult that something that the output of an AI looks like one of your works. That's why our focus is not on the output, but on the input. So the data that are being fed to an AI, that's the easier part to regulate. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. And we've got a question from Matt asking, oh, just shut up and disappeared, hang on. Um, so a question for Nogul. When we think about the surveys you showed, can we say that the old generations are kind of pessimistic about their art being stolen, while younger generations don't have much problem with it, rather showing excitement about the upcoming technology? Is that your takeaway from the survey, do you think? Yeah, well, actually, it's, it's one of the point outs that we need to uh, get into our considerations when we look at the younger generation. Um, they seem quite excited about AI, and uh, they uh, and I'm hoping I'm hoping that all this young generation artist community is also aware that we should use AI just like one of our brushes or Photoshop. It should not re replace our creativity as a hum human creative people. Um, so this is this is a fine there is a fine line right there. That's what I wanted to uh, attract our attention to. There are all these societies um, and, and governments and um, other uh, companies, everybody is involved in this new era of digital age of uh, creative world. But the main um, power is actually in each individual. Uh, it's on us, actually. How we unite, how we make a big one, uh, big voice and know about um, um, what is our rights and how we should protect our rights um, in this process. So each individuals, I think it is, um, it is not a um, negative thing that younger generation is quite enthusiastic about using AI in their um, artistic life. As far as we keep the awareness and the responsibility of um not um letting the ai generate art replacing the creativity of humankind uh, ai should always stay there as our assisting tool for creativity that's very important and every single individual 
has uh, the responsibility to have this awareness. So this is one of the reasons why we are doing all these events and everything. And yeah. yes, elderly, elderly people, and when I talk with many illustrators in our community as well, um, they have this lack of um, usage uh, uh, um, for the uh, applications, uh, you know, uh, the new technology, the tools are really overwhelming for many illustrators. Um, so younger generation is much comfortable using and adapting themselves. And, and as far as if they can get used, um, get advantage of using it um, to, to, to save time um, and use it as their assistant as a tool, uh, yeah, it's a life-saving thing as well. You know, we have AI in every part of in our lives at the moment. For instance, Samsung just developed an AI app. You just take a photo or a dish when you're eating it. It just gives you the whole description of how you can cook that meal. Uh, I think it's great, you know. The technology right. is not that bad thing all the time. But yeah, we, we just need to know the um, borders and, and yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, Nagul. Um, we've got quite a few questions coming. I'm conscious that we're kind of nearing the end of our time. Um, but next one up is, are there any tools we can use to detect whether an image has been generated with AI? Um, I mean, there's, there is talk obviously about labeling outputs from AI, which is um, on, on go, ongoing, of course. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything actually out there. If uh, anyone this might know. Can I ask a question as well to, to, to us? Yeah, can we just finish this one and just see if anyone's got an answer for yeah i i think i just have something to add uh for a while uh, a popular tool has been hive hive ai but uh don't use it if you know it um because well first of all it's easy it's easy to, to trick it just you just need to turn an image 90 degrees and it doesn't detect it as a ai made anymore and if you upload uh and if you're a free user so if you use it for free and if you upload an image that it's actually not ai they use it to train their own generative ai uh, so if you know that, don't use it. Uh, that was a popular tool a while ago, but yeah, um, better to avoid that. Just that. Yeah. To, uh, to be as you want to answer that. Yeah, just short. I don't know a specific tool, but I think in the future there will be like watermarks. There are like uh, um, yeah. ongoing uh, um, um, things that, yeah, AI could do watermark itself pretty good. I think so. Hopefully, that will be a thing for the future. Yeah, great. Another question from Ko saying: Is it possible to experiment with AI without giving away your images? Um, so, say if you upload your own images into a, a platform that allows you to create something based on those images. My understanding is that the platform then set the terms and conditions say that the platform will be able to include your images within their data set. Um, I don't know if anyone else has got any further information on that um it's quite likely they would do of course they want your images um but of ai in the beginning they on dali they had the statement that you give the image to them if you use it and now they just don't mention it anymore i don't know <laughs> yeah i think i think mid journey says that if you upload stuff they keep it on but the I, I think it's also important to well, to challenge the way we use words. Like uh, experimenting with AI, as Tobias said before, it's something that is possible to do in an ethical, uh, even in an ethical way, not using others' images. You can't do that if you're using certain AI services, which is what these companies are doing. But we should pay attention to not mistake certain specific AI services, which are like three mainly, Midjourney, OpenAI, and Stable Diffusion, with AI in general and generative AI in general. Generative art is something that has been done for decades at this point. And Mid Journey is just a way to do generative art. It's not generative art in, in itself. Yeah. Well, and one of the questions from Gabriella was actually do you have information about which are the custom trained AIs um, that us illustrators can use to train them using our own work in private ways, not offering our data? Um, I don't know if you've got any names you want to give out. Um, should I find we have to find that ourselves. Um, um, we've got uh, maybe two more questions here. Um, we had one about 
um, or music, which maybe isn't our centre here, but someone's asking, is there something like Glaze, but for musical content? I'm, I'm not aware of that. But um, somebody's hopefully working on it. Uh, see if that's happening. Um, and we've got a question from Keith, who I assume is in the UK, saying, is legislation happening in the UK similar to the EU? And if so, how can illustrators get involved in lobbying? Um, unfortunately, no, it's not happening in the same way in the EU. We have been involved in discussions through the British Copyright Council and the Creators' Rights Alliance, who we're members of, with the Intellectual Property Office in the UK. And as you've been hearing from our speakers, the government's focus is completely on um, users. It's not on the creators whose work is being exploited to, to generate all the all the outputs. Um, so unfortunately, sadly, it's no surprise that um, yeah, most governments don't come from a starting point of oh, what about the creators? You know, what, what are they thinking about this, and where's it going to go? But yeah, if you remember, Keith, brilliant. We all will be keeping in touch about this stuff. Um, if you're not, sign up to our newsletter or maybe join us and we'll we'll keep people informed about what we're doing in the UK. Um, if there's one more question, we could do that one. We've got seems to be lots coming in. Um, uh, so uh, Karkazan is saying the discourse around AI and illustration is a rights based issue. Once artist rights are respected and protected, then there is no need for outcry. But we are in a LimeWire situation right now, and even that got fixed. LimeWire, I think, being the music downloading um, situation. Um, any other questions? Um, yeah, a comment about the UK government just seeing the money signs for AI, not the right-based issues of creators. Yes, it's. Um, I suspect every government would probably be thinking along those lines. Um, Elsa saying she missed a question. OK, sorry, yeah. Um, so Elsa has got a question for Francesco. How long do you think it will take for companies to step down from systematic scraping with, with the help of the AI Act and lawsuits? Because it may not be sustainable for some illustrators to subsist in the current environment. Is there uh, a it's, it's not easy to answer. I, I have a controversial answer on this and, uh, and something that in, in a year might be uh, bite me back. Uh, Right now, these companies are not making that much money. Uh, maybe open AI a little bit more, but these things, these AI services, cost a lot of money, a lot of energy, and it's difficult to, for them to make profit because, for example, images, it's not exactly the more profitable way to make money for a company, so if you speak just about stable, stable diffusion. Um, it's possible that their, their idea was, in fact, to use images as a Trojan horse to enter the market and then start doing more profitable things. Thing is that these companies are facing a lot of backlash, a lot of potential lawsuits, uh, a, lot, a lot of potential laws. And I I think that it, it is possible that in a year from now, we, even if the AI Act is still in the works, even if the lawsuits are still in the works, in many ways, we might look at these AIs as we look now at things like the metaverse or NFTs. I know it's controversial because the, the usual narration is that these things are here to stay and we have to accept them. But I'm not sure about that because a lot of things about these AIs are more hype uh, than anything else, are more tech hype uh, than anything else. And in a lot of ways, it resembles the NFTs and metaverse in the way these companies are presenting these products as something that it actually, they are, as something that actually doesn't exist, as something more technological and complex than what they actually are. Um, so since they're facing a lot of backlash, since there is the copyright issue, since uh, not all companies want to use them openly because they face ba backlash from the public and they can't register them, and since there are a lot of legal and ethical issues, it's possible that in a year or so it won't be as sustainable uh, as it is uh, anymore for these companies to keep hosting these websites, and it's possible that they will have to step down a little bit. Uh, I don't know, it's controversial, you know, in a year you can come back to me and say, ah, you were wrong, and now AI rules our life. Uh, but mm, it, I think it's possible. We are seeing that, I think we are seeing that trend. It might not seem so, but mm, I think we are going in that direction. Well, I like that. I like that viewpoint. That's really interesting. And that's uh, an interesting way to finish off on. Um, we're a little bit over time, um, but... Thank you so much for all, all of you coming along to listen to this um, on our excellent panel. Um, Paolo, Tobias, 
Nurgle, Anna Karina and Francesco. It's been delightful hearing from you. Thank you so much for giving your time and energies to present all this to us. So I hope everyone's leaving with a bit more information, understanding of artificial intelligence and its challenges and um, things to maybe embrace. Um, and do check out the EIF website. Like I said, we'll be making this um, recording available shortly. No massive time frame yet, but hopefully it's fairly soon um, on the EIF website. So do check it out and also have a look at the Agar one and donate if you wish to this, the GoFundMe. I'll put the link in there for... Uh, in the chat so have a look at that so once again big thank you and um goodbye enjoy the rest of your afternoons and don't worry about ai thank, thank you. you thank you thank you bye-bye bye-bye thank you so much bye-bye bye-bye